This video is sponsored by Dashlane. Circuits and electronics, image processing, computer graphics, quantum mechanics, the Google PageRank algorithm, any kind of network, other stuff. These are the kinds of things where matrices are used and extremely important for understanding or analyzing different systems. And although I can't discuss everything in one video, this should give you some insight into the applications of matrices beyond what an introductory course might include. Now, in the beginning, matrices can be one of the most boring subjects we learn in math. Maybe not for everyone, but at least that's how it was for me. I mean, we're told, hey, here's how matrix addition works. Real simple, you just sum the corresponding entries and you have your answer. Then multiplying a matrix by a single number is as simple as multiplying every entry by that value. But when it comes to matrix multiplication, we do this weird row by column dot product multiplication, which some teachers just give no context to. So yeah, this isn't the kind of stuff that makes you want to major in matrix math anytime soon. I mean, you might learn more in high school, but overall, a lot of it just isn't that exciting. However, I promise matrices are used way more than you probably think. But the first thing we need to realize is that matrices do things to vectors. Don't take this as a definition, because it's obviously not, but we do need to see what happens when we multiply a matrix by a vector. For example, a vector that starts at the origin and ends at 1, 1 can be written in matrix form as shown, x component on the top and y component on the bottom. And when you multiply by a 2 by 2 matrix like this, through the multiplication rules we get a new vector out, in this case of 1, 3. So we put a vector in, and the matrix scaled and rotated it to get a new vector out. This is what I mean by the matrix doing things to the vector, and in this case different inputs will be rotated and scaled differently, which we'll see in a sec. Now, some matrices are much simpler, like this one here just rotates. Put a vector in, aka multiply by the matrix, and out will come the same vector rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise. This matrix, on the other hand, will just scale, any vector that goes in comes out twice as long. But most 2x2 two two matrices like this one we were analyzing aren't as simple. Different input vectors, I'll just put a few here as an example, get scaled and rotated differently. However, the transformations are all linear, as in any vector on the same line as one of those inputs will be mapped to a vector on the same line as the corresponding outputs. These linear transformations are why we call the first in-depth class on matrices linear algebra. Anyways, I'm going to redo those transformations once more, but this time pay attention to this vector here. You'll notice it's the only one that is just scaled. It doesn't rotate at all. And this would happen to any vector on that same line because of what we just saw. Any vector that is only scaled by a matrix is called an eigenvector of that matrix. And how much the vector is scaled by, or 2 in this case, since the length doubled, is known as the eigenvalue. I'm not going to go through how to solve for these, but the vocabulary will come up later. Now the last thing to mention is that the first application of matrices we typically learn is how they help us solve systems of equations. The coefficients can go into a matrix, the variables go into another, and the outputs go here. Notice I'm using the same matrix as the one from the last slide, by the way. Using the rules of matrix multiplication, you can see that this and this are the exact same. So really, what this is asking is which input vector does this matrix map to 1, 3? Well, we already saw the answer to this. 1, 3 is this output. And the question of which vector will the matrix map to this involves us just doing the same transformations as before, but backwards to find the answer is 1, 1. That will be our solution. Going backwards is like applying an inverse matrix. And when the desired output is the one being multiplied, then the vector it came from comes out. So x equals 1 and y equals 1 are the solutions. If we plug those into the original equations, then both are satisfied, which is exactly what we were looking for. If you haven't seen 3 blue, 1 brown's Essence of Linear Algebra series, definitely check that out. This will all make a lot more sense. But here, we're focused on applications, which we're going to get to now. Now, when systems of equations get more complex, all we have to do is expand our matrix, and we can analyze the system with as many variables as we want. 
The reason matrices are used in circuits and electronics, for example, is because these can be represented by linear equations in which all the voltages and currents are the unknown variables. When the circuits get hectic, where we don't want to solve it by hand, we can just have a computer find an inverse matrix and we'll have our currents and voltages. But that's still not too exciting. So what about a system that continuously evolves over time? Like for example, let's say there's a zombie outbreak at the local high school, pretty standard situation, and the place is quarantined so no one can go in or out, but the zombie infection is spreading. So we've got humans in the school and zombies, but no one is coming in or out, so the population remains the same. Now let's say every hour, 20% of humans will turn into zombies due to being infected. There is a cure for the disease, luckily. However, it's not always guaranteed to work. So we'll say that every hour, 10% of the zombies will return back to humans. At this moment, if there are 150 zombies and 150 humans, the question is, what is going to happen in the long run? Now we're going to assume the changes happen in discrete intervals at the hour. So let's see what happens in the first hour. For the humans of the 150 starting out, 80% of them are going to stay human or not become infected. But we also have to add the 10% of the 150 zombies that become cured and turn back to human. This leaves us with 135 humans after that first hour. It went down just a bit. For the new total of zombies, we would take the 20% of humans that got infected, plus the 90% of the 150 zombies that are not cured, giving us a total of, of course, 165, since these two numbers add together must remain 300. But we want to know what happens after a long time, so we got to keep going. After another hour, we write the same percentages, except now the number of humans is 135 instead of 150, and for the zombies, we got 165 instead of 150. This outputs 125 for the humans and 175 for the zombies. So we seem to keep losing humans, but will this continue? Well, what we have here is some linear equations that can be represented as a matrix of those percentages, which don't change. This is multiplied by the inputs H and Z, or the current population of humans and zombies at any time. And all of this equals the populations after that given hour. This is called a Markov matrix, by the way, since it's column sum to 1 and it has no negative values. But this is like what we just saw. The matrix we have is going to do stuff to, or scale and rotate, the input vector. The first input was 150, 150, the initial human and zombie populations. And after one hour or multiplication, it gets moved to 135, 165. But we have to keep going and apply another transformation, sending it to 125, 175, the populations we found after two hours. So as we keep applying these multiplications, the real question is, where does this vector go? Well, let me put a few vectors on the graph to show this, each representing populations which add to 300. If we do the matrix multiplication and look at the transformations, you'll notice this vector, or anything on this line, stays put while everything else moves towards it. That vector is an eigenvector of our matrix. The associated eigenvalue is 1 since it doesn't scale. And since that vector doesn't rotate or scale, it is the equilibrium of the system and therefore the answer to our question. After a long time, the populations will settle to numbers which lie on this line and add to 300, which would be 100 for the humans and 200 for the zombies. Any other population values will just move a little closer to these after each hour. If you put those values inside the equations from before, you'll see the output remains 100 and 200 for the humans and zombies respectively. Then if the percentages were to change, the question just comes down to what is the eigenvector of the new matrix? There may not be a zombie infestation anytime soon, but this kind of math could be used to analyze how a virus will spread throughout a population, for example. And one of my favorite applications of this is the Google PageRank algorithm, which involves Markov matrices and ranks websites by treating outgoing links as probabilities of transitioning from one site to another. For more on that, I have a dedicated video, which I'll link below. Now, moving on, here's a happy story. Not at all. On April 29th, 1992, a man named Reginald Denny was beaten nearly to death live on national TV, and this was just a completely innocent man who had done nothing wrong. 
You can see Reginald laying here, probably unconscious, after the attack. The attack itself can be seen here on YouTube, but in an attempt to not get age restricted like that video is, I'm only showing the portion right after. Now the backstory here is that April 29th, 92 was the first day of the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. Reginald Denny was a truck driver whose route for the day involved going through an area where rioting was taking place, which he was not informed about. When he got there, he was stopped by rioters, dragged out of his truck, and that's when the beating took place. Now, identifying who assaulted Denny was not easy since the quality of the live footage wasn't amazing. But what helped law enforcement confidently identify one of the attackers was some advanced math. To understand how this was accomplished, we need to first look at what a digital image is. A digital image, when you look real closely, is just made up of a bunch of pixels, each of a single color. Those colors can then be represented by some numerical value. Which means like a square picture made up of a million pixels, 1000 along each edge, could be represented by a thousand by 1000 matrix, where the entries are the color values of each pixel. Working with black and white pictures is much easier though, because a black pixel can be represented with a zero, and a white can be a one, let's say. We'll actually work with grayscale images here though, meaning anything in between zero and one can exist, which will correspond to a different shade of gray. So when it comes to image processing and manipulation, whether it be blurring an image, detecting edges, sharpening an image, and so on, it all comes down to manipulating the pixels in a very specific way. To see an example, let's mathematically blur this image of the number one. To do so, I'm going to make a 3x3 three three matrix where every entry is 1 ninth. This is known as a kernel in image processing, by the way. Then what we're going to do is lay this kernel over our image matrix and multiply the individual entries in each square together, then add the results. In this case, it's just 1 times 1 ninth, 9 times, so the sum of all those is 1. Yes, this kernel is really just finding the average of the pixels inside it. From there, we're going to take that sum of one and set the center pixel to that color in the new image. It just so happened not to change. It's still one or white, but that won't always be the case. Now, you'll notice this grid on the right where the blurred image will go is the same size as the one on the left. To get the entire blurred image, we're just going to sweep that red section across the original one. When we slide it over once, all those pixels are still one, so the average is also one, and that's what this new pixel becomes. But after sliding over again, the kernel contains a black pixel, so we find the average of eight ones and a zero, which is about 0.89. This corresponds to a very light shade of gray, which we will put in that middle square. After sweeping across the image, mapping each new number to the blurred image, these will be the values. I know this method doesn't really account for the border, but for our purposes, we're just going to keep that white. Now I'll actually color in the pixels based on their values, and we get a blurred image of the number 1. Actually, this is extremely blurred, almost beyond recognition, but if we put an outline along the colored region, we can see the 1 is still kind of there. The reason this is so blurred is because we're only working with 100 pixels. But what the kernel did was kind of took this sharp edge in the original image between black and white and smoothed or averaged it so we get this fading from dark to light in the blurred image. The kernel we use represents a type of blur known as a box blur. And from Wikipedia, if you input a picture with many more pixels, then apply the blur, this is the output you get. But there are several other kernels that will all accomplish different things. A Gaussian blur also of course blurs the image, but it assigns more weight to the middle square, so dark pixels stay fairly dark and vice versa. There's a sharpen kernel, and there's edge detection kernels which search for sharp changes in color. You'll notice that all the numbers in this kernel sum to zero, so if we put it over a section of an image where all colors are roughly the same, multiplying by these numbers then adding the results would just yield zero or a black pixel which is why that corresponding area is black. The only sections that aren't are where we find sharp changes in color, aka an edge. As another example of edge detection, here's a poorly taken photograph of someone's arm, and by using edge detection algorithms, researchers were able to identify a region of some kind of birthmark or tattoo. Well, this is actually a zoomed in portion of this image, where those men can be seen beating Reginald Denny. 
Using image processing techniques similar to what we've seen, one company was able to determine that this mark was a rose tattoo affiliated with a certain gang in Los Angeles, and it was this that helped them eventually secure a conviction of one of the perpetrators of the attack. Now all of this may not have involved much matrix math like we saw earlier, but note I did simplify some things to avoid going into too much detail. And not only image processing, but computer graphics heavily use matrices. With these, what we can do is take geometric data and incorporate it into a coordinate system. We can then scale, rotate, reflect, shift images, and more through matrix manipulation. But things do get much more complicated. Like when you want to project a 3D image into a 2D plane, we can use matrix math to map the 3D points and find where they would appear on the flat screen. Not going to go into much more detail than that, but again, computer graphics are another very useful application of matrices. But for those wanting some real tangible results that come from matrix math, let's look at networks and graph theory. Graphs can represent a lot of things. People and who they're friends with, connections on a dating app, networks of cities and how they're connected, websites and how they link to each other, and so on. With small networks, it can be easy to intuitively understand what's going on. Like if I said here's a group of coworkers and connections represent mutual friendships, it wouldn't be hard to see like this is the most popular person and this is the least popular with only one friend. If you had to find how many mutual friends these two people have, no big deal. You can just count and see that's three. But when the networks get more complex, we need mathematical tools to help us identify key things. This could be like which website should be ranked the highest on the web, which I mentioned earlier. It could be finding who is more likely to spread a disease in a college full of students. Or which people involved in the 9-11 terrorist attacks were most critical to the operation and should be prioritized by law enforcement. Yes, they actually did this after 9-11, which I have discussed in a previous video. We need some mathematical techniques in these cases so we can find things that our eyes aren't always able to when the connections get this chaotic. But let's see what matrices can reveal when it comes to dating apps. Imagine this app only has three men signed up that will label one through three, and three women labeled four through six, and they're matched together as shown. These are mutual connections, by the way, like both people swiping right, and you'll note for now there are no same-sex matches. We see this first guy is matched with all three women, the second guy with two, and the third with one. Now this graph provides a nice visual for this situation, but what we can also do is make a table with six rows and six columns for the six people and analyze this instead. We'll say if two people are matched, like person one and person four are, then in the square located in column one and row four, we will put a one. However, since these are mutual connections, we need to also include a one in column four and row one. Basically, if 1 matches with 4, then of course 4 has matched with 1, so the data has to reflect that. So that means, yes, the table is going to be symmetric about the diagonal. Then if two people are not connected, like person 1 and 2, we'll put a 0 in that square, in this case column 1 and row 2, but of course we can't forget column 2 and row 1. Since no one matches with themselves, the diagonal is going to be all zeros, and then these would be the rest of the connections. So if you want to know whether person 5 and 2 are connected by the table, just go to column 5 and row 2 or vice versa and see if there's a 1 or a 0 there. From this there are obvious things we can see. Like for person 1, we can look down their column or across their row and find they have 3 matches in total because of the 3 ones. But we're going to use some slightly more advanced math to analyze this graph. So instead of considering this a table, we're going to call it a matrix by just taking away the grid lines, but otherwise nothing has changed. When it comes to graphs, this is known as an adjacency matrix. Another way to interpret this though, is that it tells us how many paths of length one exist between any two nodes. Oh, and for the rest of this video, when I say path, I just mean any sequence of edges that joins a sequence of vertices, basically just a walk. Those who know graph theory may not like this because a path is usually more specific, but I am being generic here. Okay, so what's this really mean? We'll look at column 6 and row 1. We know this says that those two people are matched, no big deal. But it also means there is one path of length 1 that exists between them. Those are saying the same thing. If we put a dot at person 1 and can only traverse one edge, well there's one way to get to person 6. 
that's what this one represents. On the other hand, there are zero ways to get from person one to person two in one edge. If you start at person one, there are paths to person two, but they all have a length of two, which is not what we were looking for. But now, what if I want to see quickly how many mutual matches two people have? Well, if we look at person one and two, this isn't tough. We see there are two mutual matches. However, this question of mutual matches is no different than asking how many paths of length two exist between person one and person two. Well, we just saw that. The answer is two, as expected, since it's the same question. Again, if I start at one, I can go to four than two or five than two. Those two paths mean two mutual connections. The cool thing though is that we can find how many of these paths of length 2 exist between any two nodes by just multiplying the adjacency matrix by itself or squaring it. We see for person 1 and 2 there are two mutual connections so that checks out. Then if you look at the graph for person 2 and 3, they have no mutual connections. And on the matrix this checks out as well from column 3 and row 2 having a 0. However, person 1 and 3 are both connected to 6 and no one else, which we can also find in the matrix, and you get the idea. But now, what would the diagonal mean? Well, that's how many paths of length 2 exist between a person and themselves, aka how many matches they have. Think about it. For person 1, if I start there, to get back to 1 in 2 edges, I can go to 4 than 1, 5 than 1, or 6 than 1 three options for the three connections. This is why we see a three there in the matrix. Person two then has two matches and it goes on. Then if we multiply the new matrix by the original, the same as finding the original cubed, we get all the paths of length three from one person to another. See the original matrix to some power tells us how many paths of that length exist between any two nodes. Now if we have a same sex connection and link 1 to 2 let's say, all we have to do is add a 1 to the original matrix in the first column second row and vice versa. See when implementing this into software we just have to make small tweaks to the adjacency matrix and from there squaring or cubing it tells us a lot. Actually something I found interesting was what the matrix cube tells us, specifically the diagonal. For one it tells us how many paths of length 3 exist between a person and themselves. But looking at the graph, a length 3 path back to yourself tells us there's a triangle there. I'm not going to explain this one in depth, but if you sum the numbers along the diagonal, also known as the trace of the matrix, and divide by 6, that tells you how many triangles in total there are in the network. I just found that to be a cool thing the matrix tells us, which you wouldn't think about at first. Then, on another topic, something I haven't even mentioned yet is machine learning and neural networks, which are coded with and manipulated by matrix math. Mathematically, matrices are a huge aspect of what allows the machine to quote, learn. Or in terms of security, there's an example of an older kind of encryption method, which is the Hill cipher. This cipher incorporates matrix operations in order to encrypt and decrypt messages, although no, it's not a modern encryption method. And as much as I'd love to keep going into depth on different subjects, this video is already quite long, so hopefully this showed just how powerful and impactful matrices are though. But also regarding encryption and security, I do want to thank Dashlane for sponsoring this video, a company that's dedicated to keeping you safe and secure on the internet. Dashlane is a password manager that, well, does several things. One, it'll safely store all your passwords all in one place and sync them between devices so you never have to deal with resetting all those passwords you made months or years ago that you can't remember. With this, Dashlane will also autofill usernames and passwords for any site you have stored in their vault, making it just a little easier to navigate the internet. Something more important than remembering passwords though is having secure passwords and being safe from hackers, which Dashlane takes care of. We're told we shouldn't store the same password for different sites, since being hacked in one place makes you vulnerable elsewhere. And with Dashlane that is solved, as you have the option to have them auto-generate very secure passwords to be stored and used across all your devices. You will have one single master password that you create when you sign up for Dashlane, and that is used to encrypt all others. So even if someone were to gain access to internal servers, they would just see gibberish. You on the other hand can feel safe knowing you have different and very secure passwords for each site, Yet all you have to do is remember one single password. 
Plus for ad security, they'll notify you if any of your data has been compromised to give you complete peace of mind as you browse the internet. Pricing is already really cheap, but if you sign up at the link below or go to dashlane.com slash major prep, you'll get 10% off your premium subscription. Plus there's a 30 day free trial, so no risk in just giving it a try. Again, links are below, and with that, I'm gonna end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, hit the bell if you're not being notified, and I'll see you all in the next video.